Um, my paper today feeds into some of my larger uh, interests of really trying to understand uh, ancient education and the world of books and learning, uh, not only from an, an educational perspective, so from what somebody would learn at school, but also just the culture of, of book learning and bookishness. Uh, and so today I'm going to be looking at sympodic uh, learning, so basically the idea of ancient symposia, particularly the genre of it uh, and the literary uh, discussions. Um, and I'm going to read my paper and hopefully we'll be able to have uh, some discussion afterwards. So, uh, for the ancients, uh, the best pieces of literature were both entertaining and instructional. And in our investigation of ancient symposia, we witnessed a similar pairing, although in, the ca in this case, our, the theme of instruction and learning is much more prominent than in other literary forms. This paper will evaluate the narrative worlds constructed by the authors with a specific focus on the way that learning is represented in ancient symposia. In particular, we will explore the themes of who should learn, what they should learn, and when they should learn. Finally, we'll look at the symposia genre to see how read, the reading tradition influenced the way that the literary form developed over time and how previous works were seen to instruct later authors in their writing. So, symposia texts. Now, the first requirement of this paper is to differentiate between symposia, as in drinking parties, and symposia, as in the literary work. Uh, the former were common events in antiquity in which a, a group of people, typically male, gathered together to drink and enjoy each other's company, not unlike what we did last night. Uh, Although we had females as well. Yeah. Pardon? No, I thought like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was, it was it, I had a fun time. Uh, the latter are uh, literary works. <laughs> yeah, just, it's just the beginning. The latter are literary works that depict drinking parties uh, focused, uh, focusing on debates and discussions that occurred. Uh, although in the narrative world, the latter are said to be representative of the former, the ancient reality of these events was surely much less neatly organized. Uh, the works that have survived are intricate literary writings that amuse the reader whilst educating them. Indeed, in these works, the blending of historicity and narrative alongside autobiography and philosophy create a complex works that beguile simplistic categorizations and readings. Almost all of the texts we're investigating present the narrative as reported speech. Someone hears from someone what happened at a, dinner par a particular dinner party. For Plutarch and Athenaeus, these works are more autobiographical, the one must not be too quick to conflate reported action with historical reality. No doubt elements of personal experience will be included within the text, but we must also be aware that the elements included are there because the author wished them to be. The entirety of the text is the creation of the author. In light of this reality, caution must be used when seeking to determine the historical nature of each work. Although determining historicity is not the focus of this investigation, Elements uh, and values found in the narrative world reflect, I argue, views held by certain people within ancient society. Furthermore, we have in the works of sympodic writers a window into the world of elite men, not what we might consider a depiction of events by common or uneducated people. In fact, Athenaeus highlights this difference for us in one of his comments, which characterizes both classes of events, uh, providing a near quotation of Plato's uh, Protagoras, uh, 347 C and D, the speaker claims that, quote, arguing about poetry is like the symposia of low working class people, for their lack of education makes them unable to enjoy one another's company over wine by relying on their own voices. They therefore put a premium on pipe girls. But whenever educated men from good backgrounds drink together, pipe girls, dancing girls, and harp girls are nowhere to be seen. They have sufficient resources of their own. In this passage, we see we have a negative depiction of the symposia held by less educated, which is placed in sharp contrast with the ones being depicted by Athenaeus's narrative. As a result, it is necessary for us to remember that the presentations of symposia that have survived are from one social and literary stratum, embodying select ideas and beliefs, and do not represent the full range of such events in antiquity, nor the beliefs held by other classes, ethnicities, genders, or even other members of elite society. This understanding is important because it shapes the way that learning is discussed within the text, the expectations of what is valued by the characters, and the type of culture that is prioritized. 
It also means that we only have a portional view of what sympotic learning would have entailed in antiquity. Uh, turning to the sympotic text, the first symposium is thought to be written by Plato, and his work Plato provides a report of a drinking party at the guests in which the poet, at the poet Agathon's house, uh, that is given forthhand by Apodolus. Uh, the primary topic of the event is love, eros, and six speeches are given by the symposium participants on the topic, with a final speech by Alcibiades in praise of Socrates. Plato excels in his ability to write from the perspective of the different speakers, an idea made explicit by Agathon, who, in a desire to honor his craft, his techne, speaks in poetic verse in the style of Gorgias. A similar narrative was penned uh, roughly the same time by Xenophon. Like Plato, Xenophon recounts a drinking party at which Socrates and a number of other prominent, learned, and or wealthy people attend. A majority of the text is dedicated to each person's declaration and exp explanation of what they are most proud of. All of these answers uh, show a high degree of humor and learning as each speaker is able in turn, uh, is able to turn what it might at first be a negative characteristic into something positive, or each might choose to poke fun at himself for something that might appear detrimental. After a round of entertainment, Socrates proposes the topic of love again for discussion, and following this debate, the dinner party breaks up and the guests go home. We know of a number of symposia composed in the Hellenistic era, especially from peripatetic authors, uh, but none of them are sufficiently extant to provide a detailed discussion. Two sympotic works survive from Plutarch, The Dinner of the Seven Wise Men and Table Talk. The former is a short work, similar to those of Plato and Xenophon, in which the, dinners, uh, the diners solve riddles and give advice to the envoy of the king of Egypt. The latter work consists of nine books, each with 10 questions, of selected discussions that took place at dinner parties Plutarch had himself attended. Unlike the works of Plato and Xenophon, Plutarch's text does not follow a larger narrative arc, nor are all the questions taken from a single dinner party. Rather, table talk is a collection of questions appearing often to lack thematic or temporal order, in which Plutarch provides a carefully shaped version of his life, embedding autobiographical statements within philosophical discussions. The final work evaluated in depth is uh, Athenaeus's Learned Banqueters, or Deipnos Sophists, a 15-volume treatise of an account given by an individual named Athenaeus to his friend Timocrates of a banquet held at Lorenzius' house. Similar to Plato's work, Learned Banqueters is a dialogue within a dialogue, uh, though it is substantially longer, disproportionately focused on food, and has a huge number of citations uh, from ancient authors. So we're going to move to the theme of learning. Arguably the most common aspect of symposia is the regular display of learning and knowledge by the characters within the text. Although some ancient symposia certainly had such learned attendees, the examples that we have surviving from literature are the more extreme and are famous examples of such events. For example, Plato's symposium is written at least a couple decades after the supposed event, and Xenophon's composition is even more removed from the narrative setting. This distance reinforces the view that the setting, characters, and contents of both works were intentionally selected, likely because of the aura and tradition surrounding them. More common would be the conversations found in Plutarch's Table Talk, which are a selection of discussions he had over a number of years. Although many have assumed that there is a strong correlation between the text and Plutarch's historical experience, this perspective minimizes the nature of text production in which Plutarch actively, seek, uh, actively selected, arranged, and polished texts to fit his literary purpose. In all of these surviving examples, learned men take turns giving speeches uh, discoursing on a, uh, or discoursing on a particular topic. Oftentimes, the conversation is depicted as developing organically, moving from one topic to a related one based on the progression of the narrative, so Xenophon and Plutarch, in other texts, the topic is set by one of the diners, and each person has a turn to contribute to the discussion, so uh, Plato and Xenophon. And still some texts display a strong mixture of planned and organic discussions, Athenaeus. The range of topics can be focused or broad, although the consistent feature is that every surviving discussion functions at a high level of literary and cultural awareness. The theme of learning is prominent even among these characters who are thoroughly steeped in literary knowledge. This perspective is entrenched in the purpose or goal of symposia, 
namely to allow the attendee to feast both physically and intellectually, leaving with both a full stomach and a full mind. Conversations take place not only to show off and display one's intellectual prowess, but because all those who attend also share a love of learning. In fact, within the narratives, there are a number of instances in which one character expresses a desire to learn, uh, or that he is going to teach the rest, uh, rest of the company something. For instance, in Plato's Symposium, Socrates is the prominent character and models the attitude and posture that the reader should adopt. Accordingly, Socrates is both an ideal learner and teacher, ready to share his knowledge, but also willing to learn from his fellow symposiasts. For example, in Symposium uh, 207, Plato's Socrates expresses his need for an instructor, Didascalion, in love matters, though at the same time he is reteaching his listeners what they should take from the conversation. Similarly, although he's teaching in the text, Socrates is the ideal learner in that he is willing to express ignorance and need for instruction. As a result, as Socrates learns, so also does the reader. Although the focus in these texts is clearly on those in the upper echelons of society, some of the authors also recognize that not all who attend will have the same level of learning. For example, Plutarch in Moralia 618e claims that when he invites someone who is eager to learn, he will have him sit next to a learned man so that the latter might be able to impart some of his knowledge to the former. Similarly, there is an expectation that unlearned people at the dinner party are to take part in the discussions. However, this requires that the topic of conversation be familiar and the investigation suitably uncomplicated so that the less intellectual guests will not be stifled or turned away. If the learned members do delve into difficult or obscure topics, however, they will likely lose to dance and foolish stories those with a desire to learn, 614F. And for Plutarch, this would constitute a failure of the event. At the same time, Plutarch makes it clear that the symposium is not to become a classroom in which individuals are taught aspects they would have typically learned at school. For Plutarch, the primary example of acceptable levels of discussion can be found in Plato's Symposium, specifically Socrates' ability to express deep ideas with simple and easy premises and corresponding examples. The above discussion begs the question, what is one to, what is one to learn at or from a symposium? So far, we've discussed learning as a general item, but it's clear from the symposia that not all learning was equal. In particular, Greek literature and authors were thought to be the only acceptable form of culture. As a, um, as a result, it is not surprising that essentially all sympotic literature before the third century CE is composed in Greek, and that the culture that is discussed in all the symposia is exclusively Hellenic. One would expect this restricted focus in the works of Plato and Xenophon. However, a similar pattern is found in Plutarch, Lucian, and Athenaeus. In none of these works are non-Greek authors mentioned or quoted, let alone engaged with in any depth. Rather, all the quotations in Plato, Xenophon, Plutarch, Lucian, and Athenaeus are Greek in origin. In fact, uh, references to other cultures are almost completely absent. The notable exception to this is the extended discussion of Jewish eating and worship practices by Plutarch in Moralia 669E to 672C. On other occasions, when the conversation veered towards other cultures, one of the members of the drinking party would return the discussion to Greek matters. For example, there are a couple, ex uh, a couple examples in Plutarch's table talk where the origin of a word was thought to be derived from Latin. Um, uh, but the discussion uh, ordered, uh, ordered when someone uh, argued for a Greek origin of the word. This practice went so far as to try to provide a Greek etymological answer for the Hebrew word Levite. Overall, the command by one of the guests uh, to leave the Egyptians out of it and to find a Greek answer to our own question accurately depicts the nature of the sympotic dialogues and their passionate adherence to the supremacy of Greek culture. Who should learn and when should they do so? Although the theme of learning is prominent in symposia, there is an underlying assumption within the text, namely that the people who are learning already have some education and that they began this journey in their youth. 
The theme of when one is supposed to learn is rarely discussed within the text, but is taken as a given that a person could not fully succeed in their intellectual endeavors if they started learning late in life. The best example of this discussion is found in Athenaeus' uh, Deipnosophus 3.127b, uh, in which one symposiast offhandedly commented, comments that he is not able to progress in his discussion because he is constantly bombarded uh, by others who failed to get an education when they were young. This negative comment emphasizes the disdain that certain educated elite had for people who were uneducated or gained insufficient learning in their youth. A comparable scene occurs in Plutarch's Moralia, uh, 634c, in which a harpist rebukes King Philip II of Macedon because of his late one knowledge in playing music. Overall, one who learns late in life was not thought to be able to progress very far and so would not excel in, the, in their area of study. On the other hand, a different standard was used for evaluating women who sought an education during their adult life. Athenaeus tells a, sto uh, a series of stories about a courtesan named Gnathania, uh, attracted a lot of attention and gained a substantial clientele because of her ability to entertain men by her quick, witty comments. She was said to be so sophisticated in her conversation and knowledge of literature and elite culture that she composed a set of dinner regulations in imitation of similar documents created by contemporary philosophers. Other courtesans, seeing her success and wishing to emulate it, decided to get an education and dedicated substantial time to their lessons. As a result, they too learned how to entertain men with witty remarks and gained a greater number of wealthy patrons. In this case, learning late in life was not viewed as a detriment, potentially because such learning was not expected of women. That the women successfully gained a level of literary education was seen to be something positive. An idea supported by Athenaeus's quote of Agathon, quote, the fact that a woman does not does no physical labor does not mean that she has a lazy mind inside her. The idea of women learning is also brought up in Xenophon's Symposium, but this discussion is slightly less complimentary. Socrates, viewing a female dancer and noting her skill, said, quote, women's nature is really not all that inferior to man's, except in its lack of judgment and physical strength. So if any one of you has a wife, let him confidently set about teaching her whatever he would like her to have known. Although this backhanded compliment uh, might not be acceptable in today's culture, it does provide a small window into the world of domestic education, at least as depicted by Plato. First, it indicates that at least Xenophon's Socrates, uh, that women had the ability to learn. Second, that a woman's ability to learn was not limited to her early years, but continued through her married life. Third, that a husband had some input and influence in his wife's education. Although it's difficult to know the extent to which these ideas were accepted and implemented within antiquity, we have evidence that at least one ancient author created space for women to learn, even if that place was in the home and not at the symposium. Indeed, the common assumption by almost all of our ancient authors was that a symposium was primarily a male event and that they alone had access to the learning and teaching within. The primary exception to this female exclusion is the entertainment, namely the pipe, flute, or, uh, flake, pipe or flute girls and acrobatics who would perform for the male guests. In these cases, the women were not to be appreciated, uh, to be appreciated not for their intellectual abilities, but for their physical beauty or their talent. Accordingly, despite being present in the building, it is clear that they were not partakers of the learned dialogue. And it is also fair to assume that they would not have been encouraged to listen and learn from the discussion. The notable exception to this in Greek literature is Plutarch's Dinner of the Seven Wise Men, in which two young girls, Melissa and Eumenitus, uh, are included in the activities. However, within the narrative world, there is conflict at the idea of uh, Eumenitus' involvement, with Cleodorus uh, making snide remarks and not acknowledging her ability to create suitably challenging riddles. Eumetis is defended by Aesop, who compliments her wit, but still she does not get to speak. Rather, Aesop speaks for her. Both girls leave when the drinking cup is brought out without making any further contribution to the narrative. As a result, although Plutarch includes two girls within his narrative, they are limited to non-speaking roles. 
Nevertheless, they are shown to be listening participants of the learned dialogue. And it is clear from the narrative that Umet has, is thir has thought to be sufficiently capable to learn from her inclusion. An even more inclusive depiction is a sympotic event re uh, recorded by Philo, held by the Therapeutae in Contemplativa 64 to 90. Here, Philo compares the content, activities, and perceived function of symposium as explicitly contrasting Jewish practice with those of other nations. Unlike the Greek examples found in Plato and Xenophon, both men and women share in the communal meal as well as the teaching. Although for propriety's sake, they're kept separate and their view of each other is obstructed by a dividing wall. Both sexes are thought capable of bettering their soul through learning and take part in the hymns and prayers to God. As a result, women are placed on a much more even footing by Philo than by other Greek and Jewish authors. Nevertheless, there is no place within the symposium that Philo reports a uh, woman speaking. How does one learn? In the above, discussion, the above discussion highlights the fact that learning in symposia occurred through dialogue and discourse. Literary symposia, unsurprisingly, are often structured on the asking and answering of questions. Although collections of questions are recognized as a type of literary work, they are not limited to zetematone literature, but are regularly found in symposia. For example, Plutarch explicitly references zetematon in his table talk, highlighting their appropriateness for dinner conversation. Similarly, the symposium described in the letter of Aristeas, um, so 187 to 300, is entirely focused on the asking and answering of questions. Here, King Ptolemy II holds seven symposia during which he asks all 72 Jewish translators a different question about kingship, ruling, and a variety of other political and social matters. The questions are answered by pithy, pious say, uh, sayings, and there is no extensive speech by any one individual. In slight contrast to the use of dialogue, the symposium of the Therapeutae described by Philo only has one person answering questions, presumably, uh, and presumably has multiple askers, although that's not mentioned in the text. The singular individual is the only person to answer questions uh, because he is thought to be the most learned of the community. However, he shares his knowledge because he recognizes that all those in attendance share with him a deep desire to learn. The centering of knowledge on a singular individual is in sharp opposition to the essence of Greek symposia expressed above, namely that it was expected that all would share their knowledge and so all would learn. The localizing of knowledge within an individual not only distinguishes this Jewish practice from Greek, but also dictates the way that people can learn within a setting. Dialogue was not the only way that people learned new information, although it was the prominent way in the symposium. In antiquity, as in today, people undertook research in order to solve a particular problem or answer a pressing question. We see in a comment in Athenaeus that in addition to questioning people who might know, the standard way of pursuing an answer was to read a range of books. Examples of book learning are found in nearly every section of Athenaeus's work, although it is explicitly highlighted in certain passages. For example, in Dipnosophus 15671c, uh, the speaker, uh, Seneclus, accuses Ulpian of picking the most thorny and difficult passage for discussion, while others select those that are useful and worth hearing. Another example that reinforces the idea that books were a source of information in the inquiry uh, is the inquiry in Athenaeus' narrative by the grammarian Aristarchus and the type of flowers used in Nocretian garlands. According to the speaker, traditions and ceremonial actions have their root in ancient events, and so their origins can be identified and explained. In some cases, it is difficult to find the information desired, and so the discovery can be displayed with great boasting. Plutarch also supports this position, as he resists using well-worn examples from school to support his proposal that poetry was late, uh, late arrival to religious festivals but rather provides an example from a book that was not widely read, as both to educate and to entertain his fellow diners. More examples uh, could be offered, but it's clear that from later symposia that a deep knowledge of a wide range of literature was desirable. This naturally leads us to the question of who read ancient symposia. Plutarch, in his preface uh, to Table Talk, introduces his work by placing it within a larger literary history. 
This is accomplished by identifying previous authors who wrote symposia. So Plato, Xenophon, Aristotle, Speusippus, uh, Epicurus, Britannus, Hieronymus, and Dio of uh, the Academy. This list, arranged in chronological order, shows Plutarch's genre awareness and indicates his intention to follow a literary practice, one with which he assumes his reader is familiar. A later comparable example is offered by Macrobius, who identifies Plutarch as now being part of this tradition. Quote, I advise you at your feasts either to propound for yourself or yourselves to resolve questions suitable to the occasion. This kind of thing the ancients were so far from thinking ridiculous that both Aristotle and Plutarch and Eurypulius wrote on such questions. Plutarch identifies these authors as philosophers, implying that symposium literature was thought to be philosophic in nature. The mention of Aristotle, Plutarch, and Apuleius by Macrobius further supports, supports this association, uh, the association between philosophy and symposium, helping both ancient and modern readers place symposia within a certain literary category. Furthermore, the fact that almost all of the authors mentioned by Plutarchs are peripatetics suggests that symposia literature was important to their school and may have been part of their philosophical curriculum. One of the unique aspects of the quotation by Macrobius is the inclusion of a Latin author alongside Greek ones. Plutarch only mentions Greek authors, and as we have discussed above, Greek authors were almost exclusively mentioned in all of the sympotic works. This association is understandable in light of the strong preference for philosophy in Greek literary culture. The mention of Apuleius by Macrobius indicates that not only Greek authors were using this genre form, but that at least one Latin author had done so. Furthermore, the pairing of Apuleius and Aristotle and Plutarch indicates that Macrobius understood Latin authors as continuing the literary practice of Greek writers, a tradition started by Plato and Xenophon. The works by Plato and Xenophon are thought to be the pinnacle expressions of this genre form and become precedent setting for later authors who wish to engage in similar literary works. This is best recognized by the number of times either symposium is referenced, discussed, alluded to, or imitated by later authors. An explicit example of their influence is found in Athenaeus's Deipnosophist 5179D. Here, Athenaeus identifies elements of good literary practice in the depictions of Plato and Xenophon, namely that the former, after dinner, made libations and sang a pan to the god. And later, and the latter did something similar. Epicurus, however, fails to give customary honors to the deity in a symposium, and so receives a censure by Athenaeus. Another example follows in Deipnosophus 5186e, in which the author claims that Plato and Xenophon, again drawing on Homeric precedent, provides a clear introduction to the characters who will be partaking in the symposium. According to Athenaeus, the omission of this practice in Epicurus' symposium is a fault and detracts from the quality of the work. Ironically, Athenaeus is also guilty of this omission, failing to follow his own advice to model his work on Homer, Plato, and Xenophon by introducing the people at his dinner party. Plutarch follows the established pra pattern of introducing characters in his dinner, but he does not do so in, in his table talk. However, in this case, it is understandable as he does not recount a single event, but is bringing together a number of symposia. Plato and Xenophon, however, are not without their faults, and Athenaeus spends a portion of text identifying where they fall short. This type of discussion highlights the way that genres are discussed in antiquity, but also establishes the fact that at the time of Ath Athenaeus, there had also already been substantial debate on the nature of the symposium genre and the strengths and weaknesses of key authors. Such discussions are not found in early works, Plato and Xenophon, and for good reason. The literary form had not been sufficiently established to warrant critique or extended comparison. It is only in the work of later authors that such conventions can take place as they, both, as they look back to see the lasting quality of certain works. These discussions allow us to witness the chain of learning that has traced uh, traced its way from Plato and Xenophon regarding the nature of sympotic literature and the type of questions that were typical. In them, we see the repetition and expansion of certain themes and topics, as well as the desire to advance discussions and uncover new fields of inquiry. 
A good example of this is the topic of love, which occupies a prominent position in both Plato and Xenophon's works. Subsequent authors also considered love to be a suitable topic for conversation, but it is clear that they did not limit their discussions to those covered by Plato and Xenophon, but expanded it to deal with courtesans, prostitutes, and homosexuality in deeper and often new ways. As a result, what we see in the development of literary form, what we see is the development of a literary form to encompass additional topics and ideas. Another great example of the development of the genre is the critique and mockery found in Lucian's satire symposium, also known as uh, the carousal or the lapiths. Uh, in this work, Lucian includes a number of standard genre features, such as introducing each guest, identifying where they're sitting, and the cliche of the uninvited guest showing up and making the commonplace joke about Menelaus. However, although Lucian sets up an expectation in his readers about what the symposium should be like, well-behaved, orderly, with high levels of conversation, he undermines the traditional assumptions of the reader by inverting the roles of the attendees. The unlettered people were acting with great decorum, simply laughing and passing judgment on the learned men who were abusing each other, gorging themselves on food, and coming to blows. Lucian makes his implicit critique explicit near the end of his work through a reference to Plato's symposium as a model for how to behave at dinner parties, indicating to the reader his literary point of departure. The ability to successfully to satirize a work requires a high level of education, as well as a wide awareness among readers of the literary form to know when it is being subverted. In this case, the genre of the symposium has been sufficiently established as to allow Lucian to invert major tropes and to critique the philosophers of his day by comparing them to their more dignified predecessors. One question we do not have an answer to is how widely these symposium texts were read. The genre of a symposia was, not, was clearly not as popular or well-known uh, as other works or genres in antiquity, so epic, tragedy, uh, history. Even in Plutarch's di uh, dinner circles, he notes that some in attendance did not have a sufficient familiarity with the contents of previous symposia. Quote, uh, certain young men with no long experience in ancient literature were tapping, attacking Epicurus on the ground that he had introduced in his symposium an unseemly and unnecessary discussion about the proper time for coition." End quote. That's Moralia uh, 653b. This comment provoked a response by Zapyrus, the physician, who being very well acquainted with the works of Epicurus, claims that they, quote, they had not read Epicurus's symposium with attention. In response to this lack of understanding, some diners brought forward examples from Xenophon and Zephorus. Uh, and Zephorus took the young men for a walk after dinner to further instruct them. This example indicates that these young men, who did not have a lot of experience with literature, were at least aware of, the ex of its existence and were familiar with Epicurus' symposium to critique it. However, their understanding of it suggests that they had read it superficially and had not processed it with sufficient depth. On the other hand, even Zephorus expresses that he cannot remember all of the details of the work accurately. These examples indicate the symposia were part of Greek literary cultural heritage, and highly educated people would have been familiar with them. We also witness in the discussion of genre and the development of the literary form that previous works were used as models and were the subject of praise and critique. These discussions imply that symposia were themselves part of the education process for future authors wishing to write a symposium, and that their literary conventions and characteristics would need to be learned in order to produce a successful work of symposia. The literary form of symposia is a reflection of the values of symposia as a social institution. <clears throat> in the latter, we hear of detailed literary and philosophical discussion, which are in turn encoded in literary forms that are themselves used in subsequent sympotic events and literature. In addition to these authors, other ancient, uh, ancients read symposia and saw elements of value within it. The texts are rich with literary anecdotes and exempla that not only help the reader learn a breadth of literary culture, but they also model the idealized form of dialogue 
in which skill and speaking can be displayed. The essence of the works, including the positing of questions and riddles, draws the reader into the work of the symposias and challenges them to engage with the text's content and to cultivate a philosophical understanding of the world. As a result, the learning within the text becomes the model of teaching, the didactic element gained by the reader. Conclusion. The study has highlighted the fact that the topic of learning was an important element of ancient symposia. Indeed, the characters within the text, even though many of them were extremely well educated, were presented as eager to learn and actively doing so. For them, learning was a lifelong process, and their fellow symposiasts were their teachers as well as their co-learners. Although the narrative world was limited to the elite, the characters recognized that learning was inherently important, even for those who were lower in society. The ideal learner, according to our texts, is that of a free male who started young. But even women and adults could embark on engaging in education, though they will never be able to reach the highest heights. <clears throat> Moving beyond the world, world within the texts, we see that symposia literature itself was part of the education that the writers had. We witness that the characters' explicit discussions of previous works uh, that it was necessary for the authors to have a detailed knowledge of sympotic texts in order to produce new examples of that literary form. As a result, the texts are part of the educational program for our writers and may have been part of the educational curriculum within the peripatetic school. In addition, the texts become important for, uh, to the learning of the reader who immerses him or herself into the world of the text and learns how to engage in sympotic dialogue by being a present, though silent, member of the dinner party. <laughs>